Now let's look at an example of curvature with a non-unit speed curve. And we'll see that it is more complicated. This one, though, I took from the book because it's a it's pretty hard to contrive a good medium difficulty problem here, so I went ahead and took theirs. Um, first of all, let's look at what this curve would look like. Uh, we got t squared and then some trig functions. It's going to be progressive, although I sort of want back and forth once behavior in uh, in the x variable. Let's just think about t greater than zero, just to be simpler. Um, and so it's going to be progressive and increasing in velocity in the x direction. Here, if we ignore the sine and cosine for a second, just concentrate on the t cosine and the t sine, then it's going to be, that's going to be some sort of spirally thing in the yz. And then the sine and cosine might modify it a little bit. When t is large, though, it won't matter too much. We'll see why, the, why those are included in a second. So in fact, it's going to look like, um, let me just put that in a better way. There we go. It's going to look like this. It's going to be progressive in the x direction and spiraling in the y and z direction. And you can see that it kind of goes further and further as you go out with each spiral because of the t squared. So it's kind of a cool curve. I'm not going to try and draw that particularly accurately um, on the paper, on the, the whiteboard here. I'll just have something like, you know, like this. Okay. okay. And so it's coming out this way. So let's go ahead and calculate the velocity. That's the first thing for almost any one of these problems, physics or curvature or whatever. V of t. Um, I'll let you go ahead and do the careful calculation. Here's where we discover why this is complicated. It's to make the derivative simple. And that's just pure old-fashioned con contrivance to make the problem doable all the way through without kind of res uh, resorting to uh, numerical stuff. Okay. So it turns out this is engineered to make this just t sine and this t cosine. That's really particularly useful because the magnitude of velocity, or the speed, has a common factor of t. And then you just get square root of 4 plus sine squared t plus cosine squared t. Oh, that's not so bad at all, root 5t. OK. So um, there's our ds dt, which is going to be very useful to express it that way. It's the rate of change of position with respect to time, Okay, or arc length so far with respect to time. So, now what do we need first? Okay, one of the big distinctions between the non-unit speed and the unit speed case was we always want t. We're always interested in the unit tangent vector and how that's changing, its derivative. And we can't just say that's the same as v anymore. Okay, so that's going to be the velocity over the speed. Okay, and that's, that's really actually not bad because it just cancels out the t's here. And we're just going to get a 1 over root 5 times this vector without the t, 2 sine t cosine t. Uh, not, really, not really working too well here. Let's try to erase that. Sine t cosine t. OK. So that's not really um, a nasty vector. Now, the second thing is that the curvature, we're supposed to take the derivative of the ta unit tangent vector, we're supposed to take it with respect to a geometrically meaningful quantity, namely the length, not the time. And of course, that these are different in this case. Okay. Now, this is the thing where you might think, oh, well, man, do I have to reparameterize this with respect to arc length? Well, this isn't ridiculously hard, but we know the formulas get nasty. You do not have to do that. Okay. Oh, it's the magnitude of that, of course. So, why do you not have to do that? It's the chain rule. Okay. This is just dt by dt. And that's a good, that's an easy thing to take because that's the variable that we're actually in. And then you just have to multiply by dt ds. OK, well, that's kind of weird, dt ds. We don't see that. But we have ds dt. OK, so what we just need is we take how fast the unit tangent vector is when we go, say, one unit ahead in time. But then we correct that by saying, oh no, we want to correct the, we want to just introduce the time and, and distance conversion factor. We just divide by dstt. Multiplying by t, dt ds, just the same as dividing by dstt. Aha, this is something that we, that we know. It's just the speed again. So the speed keeps coming into every single calculation here. Um, and so another way to write this is just the magnitude of t prime of t using the, the preferred variable, the one that's actually um, we're actually using the t divided by r prime of t, the speed. Okay, or uh, divided by, sorry, let's see. Let's just say magnitude on top and bottom. It works either way. 
Okay, so that's something we can do already. Um, we're going to take the derivative of this puppy with respect to t, and then we'll just correct it with this factor. So I think I'm going to erase most of this. Let's see. Okay. I do want to save those for just a second because that's what I'm coming off of. Okay. So that's so t prime of t then is going to be, this is when you say prime and this variable is t, that really just means with respect to t, and then we're going to correct it in a second. Okay, well that's easy to take. Um, that's just 1 over root 5, common factor, 0 cosine minus sine. And so then kappa is just going to be the magnitude of that guy divided by the speed, and that's root 5t. Okay. Well, this guy, it's cosine and sine. Magnitude of that is 1, and so we get just 1 over root 5 over root 5t. Be careful with your fractions. These do not cancel. We're dividing by root 5 twice, and we're dividing by t. So 1 over 5t. Okay, finally, we've got our first example of a non-trivial um, curvature calculation. And even though it was pretty contrived, it still was, was substantial. And again, if it's not contrived at, at various of those steps, it's going to just become a mess. Okay, so one thing I want to point out is, um, remember the picture, it had this kind of tight curve, and then the curve kind of got wider as it got stretched out in X and also wider in Y and Z. Um, one interesting thing this is saying is that as T goes to zero from, say, the right, um, from the positive T's, let's not even worry about negative T's, um, kappa goes to infinity. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it means the radius of curvature is getting tinier and tinier, and that's what that's what happens with idealized spirals. Is as they tightly spiral in, that radius of curvature is going to zero, and the, the curvature is going to infinity. But that's a little bit um, unpleasant when any one of our geometric quantities goes off to infinity and blows up. That might be evidence of something that, that would be hard to analyze. Okay, so let me actually give you another example of um, something where that's in evidence with a, a simpler function and talk about another place where qualitative analysis and geometric analysis of curves come in. So this is a very, very typical example. You, you sort of have to see when you study this stuff. t cubed t squared. Well, what does that do? t cubed, that goes from minus to plus in this direction, and then t squared goes from plus to zero to minus. And I claim here's what it looks like. Okay. And what's interesting about this is that it's got a cusp here. And we looked at this, examples like this, uh, when we we're just talking about the qualitative sketching of curves. And you can tell it's got a cusp because uh, if you actually, it's not a particularly nice function if you think of it as y as a function of x. Because what is it, y as a function of x? y is the cube root of, uh, is t squared, but that's the cube root of x squared, or it's x to the two-thirds. Fractional powers, you start taking derivatives of those, you get nasty stuff. So there's a cusp here where the tangent gets vertical, and it actually, one really important thing is that it comes in downward vertical and then instantaneously bounces off and immediately changes direction to upward vertical. That's not a particularly nice behavior, even though you wouldn't necessarily notice it from these rather nice functions. What's going on here? Okay. Well, we can get a nice explanation of that by just looking at these concepts. The velocity is 3t squared 2t. Angle brackets, I guess. Okay. Well, well, maybe the acceleration is to blame. Maybe we can see something with the acceleration. No, 6t comma 2, angle brackets. It doesn't seem any particularly weird. Okay. So what is going on here? What's going on is that this is geometrically weird. This path of a particle isn't really that weird because it's coming in, and I claim it slows down and stops momentarily and then goes off in a new direction. It doesn't experience infinite acceleration or anything like that. But if you look at the geometry of this thing, we're supposed to do things like look at the speed. Okay, look at the speed. That's going to be, oh, there's a common factor of t, and then it's a square root of uh, 9t squared plus 4. Notice this, this equals 0 at t equals 0. At that cusp point, the speed is momentarily 0. That's the only place where it's 0, but it's momentarily 0. Hey, what's that going to do to things like curvature? Okay, If you think about a cusp, 
that kind of seems maybe like it's infinitely con concentrated curvature. Such a sharp point. That sounds like very, very curved. And indeed, remember, if we look at kappa, it's going to be magnitude of t prime of t divided by that speed. Okay, That is going to blow up. Go to infinity at t equals 0. Okay, so here's another example where, yeah, the curvature is going to infinity because we had to divide by the magnitude. And why did we divide by the magnitude? We don't trust this t variable. The t variable says if you traverse this curve in the right way and you momentarily stop right there and then start up again, you'll never notice anything particularly weird. What if we wanted to try to parameterize this guy with respect to arc length? What would we have to do? We'd have to look at this guy and we'd have to invert some stuff. That's not going to happen. Okay, We can't nicely parameterize this guy with respect to arc length and expect all the functions to still be nice and differentiable. Because if you force yourself to zip through this and not slow down and stop, boom, boom, you are going to get an infinite acceleration here. You're going to come in at constant speed 1, and then bam, suddenly you're going off the same, in opposite direction, still at constant speed 1. That would be infinite acceleration. So what this, the upshot is that we call a curve smooth if two things are true x y and z have to be differentiable functions certainly if we allow them to be like absolute values and 1 over x's and square roots and stuff like that that's not good but we have to require that the speed is never zero because if it can be zero it's not a guarantee but the likelihood is that we're going to get, we could very, very easily get some kind of behavior like this, like a cusp. Okay, and so there's a couple points, points of view on it. One is about that the calculus breaks down if you do it carefully, but a very nice way to look at it is you can calculate the curvature for these guys, and that's going to blow up. That's going to make this thing blow up because the speed is going to zero.